everything in between. We thank you for your faithfulness that is, that is so great. We thank you for your grace that is greater than all of our sins. God, and we thank you for how you call us to be more and more like you each day as individuals as, and as a church, Lord. I pray that you would help us to continue to grow in that. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You may be seated, friends. I want to welcome you to Anderson Hills. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is just an honor to get to share God's Word with you today. Uh, we are in the midst of a message series called Rise Up, and it's, it's more than just a message series. It's really a uh, campaign as well that we are doing to talk about how we can become more and more effective at reaching families with kids and teens, reaching the next generation for Jesus Christ, and we're inviting you to participate in that. So if you're really new to Anderson Hills, I just want you to know that you're in kind of a special time for us, where we're going to be talking more about our church than what we usually do. Uh, so that's the good thing is you'll get a good feel for us and who we're about. Um, but we are also, we're inviting our folks to uh, pledge um, uh, financially. And if you're new around here, that's not really something we expect of you or ask of you. Uh, we're just so thankful that you're here. It's kind of uh, for those of us that this is our, our home, that this is our church. Um, but, you know, we've, I was thinking um, earlier this week about the times in my life where I've made excuses, because there's plenty of them, right? I don't know about you, but I make excuses too. And I was, uh, when I was thinking about one um, a few years ago, when we moved here about three and a half years ago, I had a water ski accident. It was pretty serious. I tore my biceps, and I previously had, had been somebody who liked to exercise, and I stopped doing that because my upper body was pretty sore. And so I used that as an excuse. Seemed like a fair enough excuse. Excuse. And so I continued that excuse for a while. Um, I probably could have done other exercises, but it was a good excuse, right? And then I didn't get back to the gym for a while, and I kept making other excuses. Like, we were doing house projects, and that takes a lot of time. I didn't have time, or I was busy with church, or our family stuff, or whatnot. And they were all valid excuses. They were all true. Uh, but at the end of the day, they just prevented me from doing what I should be doing. They were ways that I was rationalizing and justifying. And as time went on, my, I was more and more healed up, and so I needed to make more and more other excuses as to why I wouldn't do this, right? Again, I, I, I'm too busy. Uh, I'm, I don't, it's not my fault that my pants don't fit right anymore. It's the people that do the laundry, right? That's, it's their fault, right? It's not, not my fault that I'm winded when I run up the stairs. It's the... Stairs fault. I don't know. It's surely not my fault here, right? And I would get to the gym, but I mean, I have so much, you know, I mean, I had this and this, and I probably watched this TV show, and I, I had a prior engagement with food, and I, I had a lot of things going on, okay? But then I made a mistake, a key mistake. In fact, I made the mistake standing right here on this stage. I was give, using an illustration, something about exercise, and I said something in my notes, or said something that was not in my notes. In fact, let me just play the video. Here's what I said. Have you ever felt a time in your life where you just didn't have the strength, where you realized that you did not have the strength to do it? I'll give you a real tangible example for me. Um, this may be surprising to you, but there was a time in my life where I did lift weights. I know you're like, yeah, right. But there was a time, okay, and I'll get back to that time. I'm saying it publicly now because I need badly to get back to this time. There I said it. I need to get back to this time, right? I admitted publicly this, that which I hadn't been really admitting publicly. It was just something that I knew myself and a few others around me. And so that day, I went out for lunch with my family. And about the end of lunch, I got a text uh, from a member of our church, Matt Howe, used to be one of our pastors, now directs FCA for all of Ohio. And Matt texted and he said, hey man, I need to get back to the gym. Let, can we do this? Let's start working out at 6 a.m. I received that text and I didn't reply for 30 minutes. <laughs> I usually reply pretty quick if I actually see the text, right? But the reason I didn't was because I was spending 30 minutes workshopping potential excuses that I could use here. And I realized I was busted. Am I going to be one of those preachers who doesn't practice what they preach, right? I just publicly said this. And let's check my calendar at 6 a.m. Oh, it looks like I'm wide open. 
So I said yes. That was uh, not quite a year ago, and Matt and I, we, we still do this, and I'm so thankful, I'm so thankful that God used Matt to call me out of my excuses. I needed that. If it weren't for that, I'd probably still be making excuses today, right? And I know that's just one, it, exercise is an easy one to pick on, but there's lots of ways in life that we can make excuses. But the bottom line is that I had to decide, am I going to continue to live into my excuses, or am I going to live into my values. Because the fact is, I want to be a healthy person. I want to be on this earth for a while, hopefully, Lord willing. And so, that's kind of part of the thing that that helps with that. That's something that I need to do. It kind of, it helps with my, I have a big competitive drive. And doing these kind of things makes me just a nicer person to be around, right? And so, so, that's important for me. Was I going to let my values win out or my excuses win out? Because, friends, God wants your faithfulness, not your excuses. In our spiritual lives, there's always opportunities to make excuses, but God wants our faithfulness. Why? Because excuses don't solve problems. Excuses don't help us grow. Nobody gets closer to Jesus through their excuses. It's by actually putting our values first. There's plenty of, um, plenty of examples of people in the Bible who, who made some excuses. Uh, one would be, uh, we, we look back in the Old Testament, uh, there was King Saul, the first king of Israel, and he, was, he had been rejected by God because he, he had disobeyed God so many times. So God sent the prophet Samuel to appoint, or excuse me, to anoint the next king of Israel. And, and he said, you're going to go to the house of Jesse, and you're going to anoint one of Jesse's sons. I will show you which one. So Samuel gets there, and Jesse's there, and he's got his sons. Uh, they, they have this kind of service together. They're going to have this big meal together. This is a big deal, right? This is a big-time event for them. And, and Samuel goes through each of Jesse's sons, one by one, oldest to youngest. And then each one... God says no. And he gets to the end of the line, and Samuel's confused because God has told him. He knows what God has told him, but then God said no to every single one of them. And so he looks at Jesse, and he says this in verse 11, are these all the sons you have? Jesse replied, they're still the youngest, but he's out in the field watching the sheep and goats. There's the excuse, right? It's, <laughs> it's, it, you're, you're here to anoint a king, right? It's surely not goat boy. You know, it's not, no. It can't, not little David. He's, he's nice and all, don't get me wrong, but, but we entrust him with watching the animals, okay? That's David's level of responsibility. You want a king? Look at my oldest. He's mature and tall and handsome, all these things, right? He would be the one who'd be right. Not, not David, surely Surely not him. But that was not God's plan. And actually, it's not surprising because God had said earlier in the chapter, verse 7, He says that the Lord does not see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You know, when we think of God's plan, we often think that we know, that we understand it uh, because there's things that seem obvious to us. All of us, we we look at the world through a certain lens. That's just part of being human. It's shaped by our, our family of origin and our upbringing. Um, it might be shaped by our economic status. It might be shaped um, by um, just our experiences in life. It might be uh, shaped by our personality, our, our age, our opinions on things, our background. All sorts of different things play into this. But God may have a vision sometimes that is even bigger than what we see. God may use things that we don't expect God to use. And in this, this Rise Up campaign, we've been talking about, um, just real specifically, improving the facility to make it better and better for reaching families with kids and teens. Uh, we're we're going to get, in this message, I'll get a little bit into that, but we really get into the details in our meetings. I've been meeting with life groups and all sorts of different groups. We're going to have an open one here today in this room at 2 o'clock, so I invite you to come back. Here you can go to church and go to brunch or lunch or whatever you do and come back this afternoon. Love to share with you some more about that and answer your questions as well. 
Um, we are going to uh, we're going to remodel our kids area. Um, looking to remodel really um, uh, throughout. I think we've got some images of this um, kids area. Looking to do some work in there. Um, also throughout the uh, other areas of the church, kind of like the lobby, that area, and and, and things like that. Um, and finally, um, we're hoping to make changes to the front of the church as well. And this is significant, okay? This is a significant change here. It's a big change for us. Uh, the front of the church is the area that I hear both the most joy and pain over as well. No surprise, front of our church has looked the same for just about 70 years. We, we added parking out there to help make it look more alive, and that was a great idea. Uh, but but this is, these are significant changes for us. Why are we doing this? Why are we talking about this? Well, when I first arrived uh, three and a half years ago, I went around to all the life groups, Pastor Mark Rowland and I, and we, um, I asked you all a bunch of questions. And one of the most important questions I asked you is this, what concerns you the most about Anderson Hill's future? What concerns you? And this, and uh, you, you gave a number of options or uh, answers, but by far the number one was this, reaching young people because we are an aging congregation. That's what you told me was the biggest problem. In fact, that one was number one. Uh, the number two was coming back from COVID because that was where we were at at that moment in history. And number three was a denomination that was struggling that we used to be a part of. And so two and three were very big items, but guess what? Number one, you said more often than numbers two and three combined, okay? So we know this is a challenge. And it's not a surprise that it's a challenge because we're a long-term, 200-year-old, multi-generational church. And a long-term, multi-generational church doesn't stay alive long-term if you don't continually reinvent some things to get more and more effective at reaching the next generation. Because the fact is, the next generation is continually changing, right? Every generation looks at the next generation's music and is like, why would they listen to that? And that, your parents did it, your grandparents did it, your great grandparents, this big band stuff, good grief, right? Like, it's always been a thing, and it always will be a thing. That's, that's, that's kind of part of, of, of how the world works. So, if this is not the first time, though, that we face this challenge. Back in 2007, we hired a consultant named Bill Esom, and I was looking through some files, and I read his report. It was so good. And he said a lot of things, but he told us this back in 07, almost 20 years ago. He said, it, by the year 2027, so we're almost there, 2027, 40% of our congregation would be in heaven. 40%. And that we were not reaching young people at nearly a quick enough rate to replace them. So in, tw in, in 20 years' time, by 2027, we would no longer have the viability to do the types of ministry we had been doing, for we would, we would have been on a very slow, and not because people were mad, not because people were leaving, simply because they were going to heaven. This happens. This happens. So we made some courageous decisions. We, we invested more and more into modern worship. We, we put a whole lot of emphasis over here. We put a whole lot of emphasis in our children's ministry and teens' ministry, these kinds of things. And God blessed it, and God used it. And today we are not smaller. We are a larger church than we were back then because God used it to bring so many people here. And I'm thankful for the courage of my predecessor and the courage of our church to do these kinds of things. Today, we have great room. We have great room uh, for a great opportunity for growth in reaching younger families. You know, statistically, uh, we, we looked at our, our uh, demographics here at Anderson Hills. And if you look at the 65 plus group, we're actually double the density here at Anderson Hills than the rest of our township. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am so thankful for every 65 plus person here. We don't want anybody to leave here. It's not that. It's saying that we need to grow. We need to grow more um, in, say, our below 65 age category as well. We need to be faithful to grow in, in both categories. 
So all this, when we looked at these things, it kind of led us to this summary sentence of our vision I've shared before. Um, By the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be a rooted community church that excels in reaching families with kids and teens. Not that everybody else doesn't matter. That was not what we're saying at all. But that we have to have an intentional focus if we're going to be able to do this at the level that God calls us to. And we shared a scripture that kind of guides us through this this process. Psalm 145, 4, let each generation tell its children of God's mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. And as we look at our facility, in many ways, it is an amazing asset. We have some of the best real estate in all of Anderson Township. We are blessed to be right here on Beachmont Avenue. 40,000 cars a day drive past us. That's a pretty cool thing. But you know, in other ways, our facility can sometimes be a bit of a stumbling block. We've got a children's wing that hasn't been updated in about 15 years, and it's due. It needs some attention, and we're going to give it that. We're going to invest significantly in this. Um, I mentioned uh, in our vision series in January that we brought in a designer that helped us look at that and really look throughout the whole church at saying, what can we do to continue to be um, a beautiful, uh, long-term, multi-generational church who's also very, very serious about reaching family with kids and teens? Today, our attendance is about two-thirds modern, one-third traditional, and, so, and we are growing. That's very rare. Most churches who do both styles of worship, it's more like 90-10, and most of them are actually in decline because they spread their resources too thin. Thanks be to God, we're able to do both here and do them both really well, and I love that. That must continue. That's a key part of who we are as a church. It's It's a great asset to us. But you know, when you look at our facility from the front... Um, I think we got an image of it here. When you look at our facility from the front, it is a beautiful traditional building. No doubt about it. It looks, um, it looks about the same as it has throughout most of our history, as I said earlier. It is an amazing space, but it doesn't really say much about modern worship or about uh, reaching families with kids and teens. It is a beautiful traditional building. And you know, for, for those who have been around our church for many, many decades, um, for many of them, that this looks exactly like the epitome of a church. Like, what does a church like look like? There it is. And that's so true for, for that generation. But, you know, as we look at, at younger generations, they, they see that as a church, yes. But if you ask them what a church looks like, they might also say something different here. If we look at Crossroads, right? Like an amazingly effective church at reaching young people. And it looks incredibly nothing like our church does, right? Now, hear me clearly. I'm thankful for the distinctions there. We're not trying to turn Anderson Hills into Crossroads. That's not the desire. For God calls us each to different things, and I'm thankful for what, the work that God does through the mega churches. but I'm so thankful for the work that he does through, through community churches. The kingdom of God needs them all. After all, uh, in Anderson Township, uh, between 25 to 33 percent of people go to church every Sunday. So our challenge is not mega churches. Our challenge is helping people know Jesus who don't know him right now. That's what we're about. And that matters to me more than anything. That's so, so important. Jesus said in Matthew 19, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. So we've talked about doing, like putting a playground out in the front of the church, right? And say, wow, well, that changes the look of a traditional church. Yes, absolutely it does. Because we want to visibly say, children are welcome here. Children are expected here. Children are a key part of who we are as a church. We go all out to welcome them, to invite them, and to help them to grow in their faith so that they can come to know Jesus as well. That's so vitally important to me. Now, so as we look at the frontage, we say, could it, could it be both? Could it be both traditional and also say that it is a place uh, for your kids as well? Um, I get to meet nowadays with a whole lot of you. That's kind of what I've uh, dedicated my September and October to. And so I've gotten to be with with a whole lot of life groups and um, with families or one-on-ones, other types of meetings. 
and I love it. I love all the time. I've, I haven't counted completely, but I was just doing a, some back of the napkin math, and it's been over a couple of hundred hours. And what a blessing it is to get to spend that much time with you and to keep on going with that. And people ask me, well, how are those meetings going? And they're going really well. Um, I would say that there's probably three kind of overall big, broad brush groups of people um, that are groups of responses. Um, the first is folks who say, I am so excited about this. I am all in. I see why we need to do these kind of things. I believe that God could use this. It, it's, it's more than a building, right? But, but, but I believe that, this, that God can and will use this. Um, some of these folks have already been pledging um, or are saying, hey, we're working on that. We're talking with our financial advisor or we're, we're praying together as a family and we're in. We're doing this. Um, this is a very large percentage of the, um, well, throughout the whole congregation, um, but especially the younger families that I get to talk with. In fact, I want to, um, on Friday, we put out a, a longer version of this video, but I want, to, want you to hear just a bit um, from the Southern, Sutherland family, um, one of these families who we've talked to. Titus, <laughs> did you know that there's going to be a new playground here at church? They're building a new playground, a big one. It's gonna be outside in the front. That playground that's back there right now is really, really cute, but the new one is gonna be an area where people of all ages can hang out. So I think for me, the um, there's a lot of excitement about right now you go by the church and you see the beautiful church and you don't necessarily know is this, a, is this a church for families? Is this just a church that looks very classic and traditional? And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you see a church, you see a church. Um, I think as we grow as a church, it's important that we focus on how to bring in, you know, uh, families, because that's what we need to grow uh, and going forward. And I think that's not just great for the kiddos, but it's also great for the parents because of all the extracurricular activities we have here at church. So not only are kids enriched, but the, the, the adults are enriched as well. We're excited about it. We're excited to give. We're excited to do what we can to support and um, knowing that we're just gonna see all the benefits for not just tomorrow, but years to come. Yeah. Now Titus is two, he doesn't say a lot. But I, I'm so thankful. I, I agree with what his parents are saying. I, I think that's it's really the heart of, of what we're about with this. Um, so that's kind of the first group. Uh, the second group talks a lot about logistics. And I love logistics. That stuff interests me. But we talk about things like, well, if we added a playground, how much more maintenance would that cost? Or if we paint the bricks, but they don't have to paint them now, how much will it cost to paint the bricks in 10 years when you've got to paint the bricks again? Or these kind of things. And these are good. I appreciate you talking about them with me. I share them uh, back with our team. Um, I can assure you these are things most of the time that we have given serious consideration to already, but we continue uh, to do so and continue to think about all of these things. And, and, we, and I want you to know that, that we think about these things and we pray about these things, asking God, what are you calling us to do? Because certainly the first version of a plan you put out is never the final version, right? You, you, we say this with design images. They never look exactly like what you're going to do. So God, what are you calling us to do? Uh, what is faithful here? Um, is, you know, for example, painting the bricks out front. Like, is this the right thing for us? Is this too much for us? We give this serious consideration. We hear you, and we pray about all of these kinds of things as we continue to work. And, and these logistics, they matter. They matter. But friends, our heart is so much deeper than just logistics. Our heart is so much deeper than just that. We're not doing this just simply to improve logistics. Whenever you build something... You add maintenance, you add difficulty, all of these kinds of things, but what you are seeking to add is ministry and life change, and thus it's worth it. It's absolutely worth some extra maintenance. It's worth um, some extra logistical things. It's worth some extra costs because that's why we're here is to reach people for Jesus Christ. And so we will absolutely, if we've got to clean a few more square feet, if we've got to maintain a few more square feet, we will absolutely do that uh, in order to reach people for Jesus. That's true about the rest of our building, and it's true in this project as well. Uh, it's, it's so central to us. And then third, uh, the third group of people, and usually, not always, but usually these are a group of people who've 
made a few more trips around the sun than some of us have, right? (laughs) And they've been at our church for many of them for many, many decades. And for some, they look at it and they say, this is too much. This is This is not what a church looks like. What it looks like now is what a church should look like. And and I hear that. I hear that. And and I want you to know how much much that crowd matters to me. I just got to preach to a lot of them at 830, right? And they are some of the most faithful, amazing people that you'll ever meet. And don't get me wrong, a whole bunch of them are very excited about this and and all in. But a few are saying, this is just, this is a lot. This is hard for me. And we talked about, I told them about how much I appreciate them. And I know that there's a number of you probably in this room here. And I want you to know, for those of you who've been around this place, I can't begin to express how much I love you and how thankful that I am for you. For truly, your long-term commitment to this church God has used this to make us who we are today. God has used it to open up the doors for so many great things, for new life in Jesus that we just celebrated through baptism, for for children and teens coming to know Jesus, for life groups that are vibrant and growing. All these things, they're possible because of the generosity of, of this generation and generations before. But here's the thing. I believe this with all my heart. Multi-generational churches thrive when matriarchs and patriarchs have a vision that will outlive them. Multi-generational churches like ours, they thrive when your matriarchs and patriarchs, meaning your, your mothers and fathers, your people who have been around here for a long time, your people who are all in, this is, this is their church, they love it, they care so much, they've seen it through a whole bunch of pastors, they've th- seen it through a whole bunch of seasons, they've seen it through great times and tough times and everything else, when, when they have a vision that will outlive them, that is the key that God uses to make a multi-generational church thrive. And the fact is, friends, it's kind of rare today. If you look around, there are so many long-term churches that are not thriving. Instead, they're dying. And that hurts my heart. That hurts God's heart. We don't want to see any church struggle and close. And for many churches in this category, they're alive today simply because of endowments from the past where they've saved up. But the fact is, the doors may be open, but the Lord isn't changing many lives anymore there. It's just a small group of people. This is what happens if matriarchs and patriarchs have a vision to keep church exactly like it's always been. If we look and say, you know, this worked for my generation, so it ought to work for the next generation. That's the mentality that starts us down a path that that doesn't lead to success and growth. No, we want to have a vision that is bigger than that, a vision that that God gives us and calls us to thrive in. You know, there's always a reason. There's always an excuse. There's always whatever to not invest in the next generation. Uh, you know, when I think about, think about here what we're doing in modern worship. Well, we had very strong traditional worship for, for, century, for almost centuries, for many, many years before we started uh, modern worship. We were very strong in traditional. We, we had three services full every weekend. We had a strong, thriving church. We didn't even build this room to be a modern worship space. We built it to be a place to eat in, right? But, but then we realized, we realized God was calling us to it. And, and we made courageous steps, big steps. We made a lot of changes, and those changes were ongoing to, to get more and more effective at reaching people for Jesus, more and more effective at reaching the next generation for Jesus. And you know, when we made that change, it was controversial. I've quoted before um, a person I think about a lot nowadays. His name is Dick Beer, and Dick was one of our, our patriarchs. And Dick did not like modern worship. He did not like the concept of it. It is not his thing at all. But he loved Jesus, and he loves the next generation. And Dick said, I don't have to like that contemporary music, but I have to pray for it, and I have to pay for it, because I believe in reaching our kids and our grandkids. 
And friends, that's who we've been, that's who we are, that's who we will be as a church. We are a church, a multi-generational church that thrives because we have had and do have such great matriarchs and patriarchs with a vision beyond that of their own. And today, friends, is an opportunity. This Rise Up campaign is an opportunity also for us to rise up and to join with them to join with them saying that, that we are now the leaders that God has brought here to this church. We stand with them and we stand in the company of, of those saints who've gone on before us. And we stand in faithfulness to God saying, God, would you use us? Would you use us to, to reach the next generation, to invite our kids and our grandkids and someday our great-grandkids into this place, that they would come to know you. We want to see them baptized. We want to see them giving their lives to you. We want to see them growing in faith. We want to hear their testimonies when they're confirmed and they, they tell about what the Lord's been doing in their lives. We want to see their lives changed on mission trips and, and events and retreats and all these things because we believe so much in this. And it's about sacrifice. It's about sacrifice. We sacrifice sometimes our preferences, things that we like. That's okay. That happens. We should sacrifice financially because that's what it takes to, to, uh, to make these kinds of changes. But you know, when you think about, um, if you think about what it means just to have children, right? Many of you, you've, you've had children or you're in the process of that now, and you know that it's all about sacrifice, when you bring little ones into the world, it doesn't make your life easier, right? Remember that first child. You used to sleep peacefully at night. Then you had a baby, and you don't sleep so much at night anymore, right? You're up with them all the time, and you're taking care of them. But you don't dislike it. You love it because this is what you wanted. You love the time with them, even when you are tired and exhausted. You make all these changes around your house. You baby-proof everything. And you don't say to those toddlers, you don't say, well, guess what? Before you came along, we didn't put plugs in the outlets. We just kept our, our, our fingers out of them. So you do that too. No. <laughs> we, we take steps to be careful and be safe. We put up baby gates, right? And say, well, I've lived in this house for decades and never fallen down the stairs. What's your problem? No, we don't do that. Because we know it takes sacrifices to reach the next generation. But it's worth it. It's always worth it when they're teenagers, right? And, and we're praying for them and we're loving them. Now we're losing sleep because sleep we're stressing about them, right? You know, we're not in regret about this. We're thankful because what a blessing it is to get to see the next generation grow up, to see the next generation uh, come to know the Lord and to follow him. That's why we exist. That's why we exist. So yeah, it'll stretch us sometimes. It'll challenge us. It'll call us to make sacrifices. And that's what I'm inviting you to do with us. We've got in the, in the rows there, in the seats, we've got pledge cards. You can fill one of those out. You can do it online at andersonhills.org slash rise up. A variety of ways to do that. We invite you to do that um, and, and to do that uh, by the end of this month, if at all possible. It's really helping us as we kind of plan what's going to happen through this. It's a stretch, but friends, we, we can do this with God's help because we are a church with a rich heritage and we are called to be spiritual entrepreneurs. We are called to be people who invest deeply uh, into this next generation. We are called to, to, answer, to answer the bell for this next generation because it's not easy to be a kid or a teen in today's world. It's not easy to follow Jesus in today's world. And, and the ministry of the church is more needed and more vital than ever. And I'm so thankful that Anderson Hills is and will continue to be in greater ways a thriving church, a thriving multi-generational church where we lift up Jesus where we introduce our kids and grandkids to him, where we make sacrifices so they can feel right at home here. Because at the end of the day, this is not my church. It's not your church. It's Jesus' church. We get to, we get to kind of occupy this space for some years, some decades, maybe even some generations of our family. And we pass it on. We pass it on to the next generation, knowing that God will do even greater and greater things. I invite you to see a vision that is bigger than excuses. 
I invite you to see a vision that is bigger than fear. I invite you to see a vision that is challenging, but that God can and will use. God has done this with, throughout Scripture. I'm sure that when, when Moses parted the Red Sea, there were some people a little nervous about going through the midst of some walls of water, right? I'm sure that, that when the people were marching around Jericho, uh, a city much bigger than they could ever handle in their own strength, there were some people very nervous about that. I'm sure when David f stepped up to fight Goliath, his heart was going really quick that day, right? But instead of living in their excuses, they lived into their faith. They lived into God's call, and God can and will use us as we do the same. So, God, we just give you thanks and praise for your call. We thank you for the fact that you are alive, that you are changing lives, Jesus. I thank you for a congregation where you have been doing this for generations. God, I thank you. I thank you for our matriarchs and patriarchs. I thank you for those who've gone on before us, for those who are still with us today, and those who you are raising up today, God. I give you thanks and praise. And I pray that you would help us to be faithful to follow you. I pray that you'd help us to be faithful to trust you. For, Lord, we love you so much. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand and worship him with us?